This presentation will consider the character of Dr. Henry Jekyll in Stevenson's novel Jekyll and Hyde. Um, this, this picture here is actually quite appropriate for Jekyll as a character because he is a man who is partially hidden away, a man whose identity is clearly divided, a man who doesn't feel like he can quite be himself. There's lots to be said about Jekyll, but we're actually going to consider him. This presentation won't deal with everything. We're going to consider him in light of this question here. This is an extract from chapter five, where Utterson goes to um, Jekyll's labo laboratory. Um, I'll, I'll read the extract and then we'll look at the question that follows. It was the first time that the lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters and he eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with red bays, and through this Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room fitted round with glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. A fire burned in the grate, a lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, and even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr Jekyll, looking deadly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. And now, said Mr Utterson, as, as, so on as, Paul had, as soon as Paul had left him, you have heard the news. The doctor shuddered. They were crying in the square, he said. I heard them in my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, and so are you, and I want to know what I am doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honour to you that I am done with him in this world. It is all at an end. And indeed he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. There's lots to consider um, in this extract. Um, I won't deal with it all in this presentation, but we'll take some time now to look at some of the significant moments here. Well, first of all, let's have a look at the way in which the laboratory is described. A dingy, windowless structure, once crowded with eager students, now lying gaunt and silent. Well, this is um, a place of science, and it is very much described in a way as if it has been abandoned. And I think it reflects perhaps the way in which Jekyll has abandoned conventional science in this novel. Um, as um, Lanyon describes it, it's unscientific balderdash in his eyes. We dealt with that idea in, in the presentation on Lanyon. Light is important here. Light um, really is a sign of positivity, perhaps a sign of truth, if you like. And the light is struggling to get in here. Um, the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. The windows are dusty and barred with iron. There is not much light in here. There is. This is a place um, that lacks hope and lacks positivity. There is a feeling that Jekyll is hiding away from the outside world, trying to shut it out. Um, we look at um, Jekyll's reaction um, to Utterson here, and he seems to be a man who is utterly desperate. Um, but he also seems confident that he can control Hyde at this point. Um, we later learn in the novel that, of course, he is transforming from one character into the other um, and back again. And he seems to feel at this point that he can control that pro process he is quite safe and he will never more be heard of. That is a statement of fact and certainty. We'll address that later in the presentation. Let's have a look at the question then. Starting with this extract, how does Stevenson present Dr Jekyll as an isolated and confused character? 
Well, we're going to deal with, there are two elements to this question, isolated and confused. And we're going to deal with both of those and think about the ways in which Jekyll is confused, the ways in which he is isolated and the reasons for both of them. Here's some key contextual information which will be important in shaping your understanding of Jekyll here. Um, you, if, if you haven't done so already, it might be an idea to watch my presentation on context in Jekyll and Hyde, which will deal with this information in much more detail. But as a recap, um, we have a, a Victorian society concerned by appearances. And as a result of that concern with appearances, this idea to, of appearing a certain way um, leads to judgment of others who don't um, conform to um, the expectation of society. Victorian society is one which is obsessed by the idea of progression, um, but at the same time um, fears regression and fears things which challenge their belief system. So there's something hypocritical, I think, about that obsession with progress. Um, that's highlighted most clearly by Darwin's theories of evolution and survival of the fittest, um, which caused great consternation in Victorian society because they came along and challenged religious belief which had existed, which had shaped the morality of society for centuries. And all of a sudden, here comes along a theory that completely challenges the idea of creationism, that God created heaven and earth. And Stevenson's own life um, is important here. Here is a man who is fascinated with the idea of the duality of human nature and the duality of the society in which he lived. And this comes about as a result of the way in which Stevenson lived his life, a perfectly respectable gentleman by day, putting up that facade of respectability. But by night time, he would visit the back streets of Edinburgh, visit prostitutes, brothels, um, drinking houses. So he saw um, the hypocrisy not just of his own identity but also of society which presents itself in this model of perfection but behind in those streets behind there's all sorts of immorality and debauchery. So let's first of all deal with um, Jekyll as a lonely character, as an isolated character, as an outsider. What are the reasons for that first of all? Well his science is progressive very much like Darwin's theories, Jekyll's science challenges existing belief. It's what causes Lanyon's demise. If you watch my presentation on Lanyon, um, we deal with the idea that um, Lanyon's had his belief system challenged to such an extent that it causes his death. Um, Jekyll, like most of the characters in this novel, is terrified of judgment. And that is primarily the reason that he creates Hyde. Hyde is a means of releasing his inner self, his darker side, without the fear of judgment of society. So I think in some ways Stevenson is encouraging us to blame society as much as Jekyll for the creation of Hyde. He is a man who is eventually in this novel shunned, and increasingly in this novel, shunned by society, even by his friends notably Enfield and Utterson, and we'll have a look at what happens in chapter 7. And that's because of his difference. Um, and, and through his difference, his friends will be tainted by association, and we see that a bit later. Let's have a look at um, ways in which then Jekyll's isolation comes about as through a fear of being judged in the extract. Um, three quotations, three dusty windows barred with iron, the dingy windowless structure and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. We've looked at already the way in which light is struggling to get in here. Jekyll, it, it's a place without hope. Jekyll seems to be sinking into a much darker place. And as a result of that, he is unwilling to let the outside world in. This feels like a man who is shutting society out. His cabinet door is covered in a thick red baize. And if you look at chapter eight, when Utterson and Poole break down the cabinet door, it is an unbelievably strong barrier between Jekyll and his science, and therefore his creation of Hyde and the outside world. He knows that this idea of his will not be accepted in the outside world. 
and he fears the judgment that will come with that. This isolation of Jekyll seems to manifest itself in a feeling of being trapped or imprisoned. If we have a look at the evidence here from chapter 5 from our extract, we have three dusty windows barred with iron, very prison-like. In chapter 7, the incident at the window, he's described like some disconsolate prisoner. And then in his own words, in chapter 10, in his own statement, he talks about the prison house of my disposition and the idea that his devil had been long caged. His devil, of course, being Edward Hyde, his inner demon. So Jekyll feels trapped by something. Um, he's trapped for a number of reasons, I think. First of all, he's trapped by hide himself by his his darker side um, who he can't escape he can't get rid of it so he's trapped almost within his body he cannot be himself but he's also trapped by the judgment of society the critical eye of society who won't allow him to be himself and therefore he retreats and he hides away and he creates hide as a means of release because he feels imprisoned He seems at first, if we think about him being confused, he seems at first a man who doesn't really know Hyde very well. Um, he says, at any moment I choose, I can be rid of Mr. Hyde in chapter three. And then in the extract in chapter five, I bind my honour to you that I am done with him in this world. It is at an end. It is at an end is a statement of absolute certainty and surety. He seems confident that he can be rid of Hyde at any time, that he can control him. But the later events of the novel reveal to us that this confidence was misguided and he was perhaps a little confused about his identity because he couldn't control it in the way that he felt he could. And then we look in chapter 10 and Jekyll seems to have come to terms by this point in his full statement as to who he truly was. He says man is not truly one but truly two. The repetition of truly there renders this a statement of fact. He's absolutely certain, as is Stevenson, about the inherent duality of mankind. The idea that we are made up of a good side that we present to society and a darker side that we perhaps keep hidden. He says, although so profound a double dealer, I was in no sense a hypocrite. Both sides of me were in dead earnest. So Jekyll acknowledges that he's come to terms with who he is. He recognises both sides of himself. And in labelling himself as not a hypocrite, there is a subtle criticism that the rest of, the, of society is being hypocritical. If we have a look at some of the other characters in the novel, Utterson, for example, who goes from a man of rugged countenance, never lighted by a smile, to a man who starts to haunt the door of Hyde. He starts to stalk him. And then by chapter eight, Utterson is breaking down the cabinet door in order to get inside and discover um, the truth of what is happening. He's become almost monstrous himself, yet he refuses to acknowledge that monstrous side in the way that Jekyll does. Sawbones in chapter one, a man described as emotional as a bagpipe. He's got nothing about him in terms of emotion. As soon as he sees Hyde, he immediately becomes monstrous. He turns sick and white with a desire to kill him. So all of these characters have this darker side within them. It is revealed to us in certain ways. And yet they don't come to terms with it because they refuse to admit that they might be evolved a from more primitive forms and they refuse to admit that they might have this darker side within them. They are so keen to maintain the facade of respectability in Victorian society. Jekyll doesn't. So in lots of ways, Jekyll is not the most confused character in the play. In fact, he's the most lucid character in the play because he's the one who truly recognises his identity. So it seems that he underestimated um, Hyde. If we have a look at the way Hyde grew throughout the novel, he grew pale to the very lips and there came a blackness about his eyes. This is from chapter three. Utterson goes to visit Jekyll and 
he mentions Hyde's name. And as soon as he mentions his name, this is what happens. And we can see, certainly see that this blackness about his eyes is Hyde starting to emerge for the first time from within him. Certainly in, in our eyes, the first time we've seen it. But the verb came here is a very soft, passive verb. This appearance of Hyde is happening gently. Let's contrast that to chapter four, when Hyde murders Carew. Hailing down a storm of blows, he clubbed into the earth. The bones were audibly shattered and the body jumped upon the pavement. Brilliant use of verbs here by Stevenson. Hailing, clubbed, shattered and jumped. Let's contrast that with came a blackness about his eyes from chapter three. These verbs now are much more aggressive, much more violent, much more dynamic. Hyde is starting to take over. By the time we get to chapter seven, the smile was struck from his face and succeeded by an expression of abject terror and despair. Well, this is, this is Utterson and Enfield witnessing Jekyll starting to transform into Hyde. The violence of that verb struck and the violence of those nouns, terror and despair, really confirmed by this point in the novel that Hyde is starting to take over. So Jekyll might appear confused, but there seem to reasons for it. And if we have a look at the theory of Carl Jung, this would support the idea that actually Jekyll's not to blame. Because Carl Jung, this theory is developed after Stevenson wrote the novel, so we're not presuming, we're not assuming that Stevenson knew the theory here. He didn't. But it is a theory that certainly supports um, what he's writing about. Jung argues that we all have a collective unconscious, another side to us, that operates on an instinctual level. And he says that we all have a shadow, a darker side. And if we don't embrace that shadow, if we don't embrace all sides of us and accept who we are, that shadow will start to take over. Well, Jekyll, as we've already discovered, is forced to hide his shadow by society. And as a result of that, that shadow gets stronger and stronger and stronger to the point that he cannot repress it any longer. He cannot control it. So in lots of ways, although Jekyll undoubtedly is to blame in some way, he created Hyde. It is society who repressed it. And it is for that reason that the shadow grew to be uncontrollable. And that is very much supported in chapter 10 when Jekyll says, my devil had been long caged. He came out roaring. He's been trapped by um, society. He's been repressed by Jekyll because he's forced to be a certain way. And the roaring there really confirms that the shadow, the dark side, which is Hyde, grew in anger and grew in intensity. And if we have a look at this idea that society is perhaps to blame for Jekyll's isolation, isolation and confusion, this is, this is um, evidenced no more strongly than in chapter seven when Utterson and Enfield are talking to Jekyll at his window, they see the beginnings of the transformation. The window is thrust down and Utterson and Enfield walk away. It says they were both pale and there was an answering horror in their eyes. God forgive us. God forgive us, said Mr. Utterson. But Mr. Enfield only nodded his head very seriously and walked on once more in silence. At their friend's time of greatest need, Utterson and Enfield walk away and they walk away because they don't want to acknowledge the truth of the dark side. Yes, they're horrified by what they've seen, uh, certainly so, but they don't want to acknowledge, they don't want to think about it. Utterson spends, spends the entire novel trying to deny the truth. He pretends he's trying to find it out, but he locks letters in the corner of his safe. He doesn't really want to read them. It tells us on the opening page that Utterson is the last good influence in the lives of downgoing men. Well, Jekyll is a downgoing man here and Utterson abandons him because of his own fear of judgment. So in lots of ways, um, society is to blame for Jekyll's predicament and for Hyde's ferocity. So to summarise, there are lots of things we could say about um, Henry Jekyll, but to summarise, 
um, in relation to confusion and isolation. He's isolated by his difference, his difference in identity, his difference in science. He's confused about his identity, but only through a desire to live up to the expectations of the Victorian moral code. Because in, in actuality, Jekyll comes to terms with his true self, and it is for that that he is punished. And he is abandoned by those he needs because of their own judgmental nature and personal fears. Both Lanyon disposes of him, Utterson pretty much disposes of him. He's relieved when he can no longer see him. I hope that um, has served as a useful introduction to Jekyll and his character and has provided some information um, that might be useful in answering the question that was identified at the start here.